before Joe Rogan became one of the biggest platforms out there, being nice to people and promoting their work or their businesses for free on your platform was a concept that was unheard of. And after Joe Rogan exposed Carlos Mencia and essentially took over the comedy scene in LA, he essentially influenced many artists and comics to be nice to each other and benefit from each other instead of, you know, always looking at each other as rivals and as competition. Well, this culture kept running strong until about last year when Rogan finally decided to make the move from LA to Texas. Now, the LA podcasting and comedy scene can be better described as toxic and fueled by drama. And in this video, we're going to take a look at how exactly Joe Rogan had everybody on check while he was in LA. And now, as soon as he left, everybody started going at each other's neck. So make sure you watch the entire video as there is very interesting information throughout. Prior to Joe Rogan being the man and having all the fame in the world, Carlos Mencia was one of the biggest and one of the most popular comedians back then. Some people might not realize this, but Carlos Mencia was insanely popular. He was insanely huge. I'm talking about his show, The Mind of Mencia, being the second most watched show on Comedy Central, right behind South Park. That's mind blowing. And this kept going for three years until Carlos Mencia himself was the one to pull the plug for the show. Now, the reason I bring that up is to emphasize the amount of influence, the amount of power that Carlos Mencia had back in the day as a comedian. As regardless of his fame, most comedians out there throughout different clubs actually did not like him at all. The reason why is because Carlos Mencia was actually known for openly bullying smaller comics, stealing their material, and being toxic about it. Sure, he had comic friends like Bobby Lee and other people that would open for him, but other than that, nobody really liked the guy and nobody really vouched for him. One clear example of Carlos Mencia showing his, this type of behavior was when Johnny Sanchez, comedian Johnny Sanchez, went on Tiger Belly and told his story, his encounter with Carlos Mencia. Now, the story is completely wild. It's very interesting, actually. I could listen to it many, many times. So let's take a look. He was still great to work with. Yeah. Uh, so funny is funny. They all know our sets. Mm -hmm. mm. They know exactly what we're going to be doing. Uh, matter of fact, Freddie was one of the writers on it. So Freddie knew everybody's sets on top of it. Settle, yeah. So what basically they were doing was they don't want the host to step on anybody's material. So Carlos was hosting. And they knew that I was, I think I was last yeah, on that. You were, you were, it, yeah. Myself you and were the other late. Guy. You were really late. On the show, yeah. Yeah. And I, at that time, I had this, my closer, my, this killer closer bit called Parking in My Parking. One of the best jokes I've ever heard. It was, it was a, about a, it was literally five minutes long. Amazing. It was about this Persian, Persian guy who was screaming at everybody because someone was parked behind his car and he was just screaming out, who's parking in my parking? <laughs> <laughs> From different person, he was calling the apartment intercom, you know, the intercom yeah, center yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. And people, they don't even know who, who's calling. Be like, hello. He's like, is this your parking in my fucking parking? <laughs> Who's parking in my parking? So yeah. It was my closer bed. I destroy it, it, it would destroy. Destroy the So Carlos knows this. Mm. So in between, he decides to do this bit on Iraq. Yeah. The Iraq war. And he goes into this long and first of all, everybody's like, remember Pat Buckles comes running and goes, what the what the fuck is he doing? Because that wasn't anything that he, he was had told to that was supposed to mm. So they already knew, but he does what? Three, four minutes on. Yeah. You know, you got to hear my friend. So he's wearing this accent out. Oh. Now, I know what he's doing. We all know what he's doing, but he played like he didn't know. Oh, fuck. That's right. <laughs> right. Fucking Johnny's got that fuck. Fuck. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The only way. I wasn't even going to go on. I said, well, oh, you were yeah. livid. That's how I, I remember. I was like, I'm just going to leave right now. Oh, right. It's crazy. <sighs> anyway. I know. It's crazy. That's the story. Yeah. And then, and then now you know why I wouldn't have gone on the road after that anyway. Yeah. Because I got asked by him after that anyway. So you know what I mean? I, I still do believe that it might have helped you. Now, here's a wild thing about that story. It shows you that Carlos Mencia was not only stealing jokes or, you know, stealing other comics' premises to for profit, but he would also take joy. He would also take joy and go out of his way to create these uncomfortable situations for his other, for his fellow comics, for his colleagues in the comedy clubs. 
knowing very well that the other comics could do nothing about it. Because, like Johnny explained, it's common etiquette for everybody, for comics to essentially give their sets, tell their jokes to the producer or whoever is in charge of the entire production. You give those people your jokes, that way they know who is saying what so that nobody steps on each other's material, nobody says the same jokes, and just to keep better track of what's going on. And this is the wild thing, that Carlos Mencia essentially did something that he knew was completely wrong, he knew it was completely wrong, and he knew the harm that he was doing, but he knew that not even the producers, not even the producers of the show could do anything to him. Because he knew, like Johnny said, that he could just apologize and pretend he didn't know what was going on. Now, that's not the only incident. It's not the only time that that has happened. We have another very clear example, another incident that showcases this Carlos's insane ego and reckless mentality, reckless mindset back in the day. We all know Sam Tripoli. And funny enough, he shared a story also on Tiger Belly talking to Bobby. Which makes sense. Bobby Lee was Carlos Mencias' best friend and, you know, he was with him at all times. So it does make sense that if anybody wants to talk about Carlos Mencia, you do it on Tiger Belly. Now, Sam Tripoli's story was not really focused on joke stealing, but instead it showed you how crazy, how ruthless Carlos Mencia was to other comics that were not kissing his ass, that were not opening for him or were not not all that nice to him. Yeah. You know, here's the thing okay. about Carlos, and I've talked about this on other things, and I know he's doing like a tour of apology. Anytime he wants to come on my podcast, I'd love to have a talk with him because he followed me. He used to follow, like, dude, the guy would call in and oh, be dude. like, what's the lineup? Wait, wait, wait. And he would always what, go. Did they do something to you in Dallas? Yeah. What? Okay, what? tell him that. Getting on, I, I was doing Addison, right? And we were having great weeks, man. So um, I'm sitting there and I'm just hanging out in the green room, which was the office back there. Anyways, Carlos comes in with this cartel of Mexicans, like just like 10 Mexicans with him, right? Yeah. And he's literally like shaking everybody's hands in the room. But he shakes my hand. He doesn't make eye contact with me. in Dallas, dude. I had this room with Car I had this rule with Carlos that if he did over 30 minutes, I wasn't going up because that to me is a headliner spot. Yeah. People are like, okay, we saw the headliner. Let's go. Yeah. I tell him, I go, if he does over 30, I'm going. Right. Yeah. They, they go, that's totally cool. He does 28 minutes. So, anyways, he goes up there, and if you listen to him on the Mark Marin podcast, he talks about how he liked to teach people lessons. What lesson was there to be learned? That he was the alpha dog he wanted to teach. Uh, upset me, dude. So he does his act, and he's going for blood. Like, he's going to bury me. And I remember him getting done, and the place goes nuts, right? And then he goes, are you guys ready for your headliner? And literally, the entire room goes, oh. I hear a, oh. someone's got to fo They're all thinking someone's got to fucking follow oh, this. Fuck. And then I, so, so... He does the thing that is unforgivable at this moment. He introduces me and runs off stage. Doesn't even wait to shake my hand, say thanks for putting me up. Runs like, and that's how I knew he was trying to teach me. Because I'm coming this way. He runs this way. He runs off stage. I have to go up on stage. I have this joke I do. From what we can gather, Carlos Mencia not only wanted everybody to see that obviously he was on top and better than everyone, he also wanted to show other comics he could mess with them, that he could do things to them that they could do nothing about and nothing would happen to Carlos Mencia, which in a way, it's super weird and we can all agree that it's a clear power trip back then. And then that obviously leads us to Joe Rogan's encounter with him. Now, this one is the wildest one in my opinion. Essentially, Rogan shares a story of how Carlos Mencia would sit at the back of the room, at the back of the show, just listening to Rogan's entire set just listening to his entire comedy set, staring at Rogan, both of them knowing that they hated each other. They, they both knew that they didn't get along, but still, Carlos Mencia would sit at the back of the room just watching his set. One man show in Aspen, and this is when I hated and we had words at the comedy store, and he knew I hated him, and yet he came into the, while I was standing there waiting to go on stage in Aspen at the comedy festival, he came into the room and sat down and watched my entire set. We, he knew I hated him. He knew that he hated me, and yet he came there and he watched, like he does with everybody. He sits and he watches. And this was a clear way to try and intimidate Rogan or let him know that you're watching him even though you don't like each other. It's like calling him out indirectly. Now, that's not the craziest thing. The most insane thing is that after that incident happened, Carlos Mencia actually went on a radio show in Tucson. 
and he told the biggest lie the biggest lie that he could have that essentially was the beginning of his downfall while he was on that radio show he essentially told a story he went in on joe rogan and completely trashed him he told the story that i just said and completely flipped it around he was telling everybody on radio that joe rogan was the one sitting at the back of the room or standing at the back of the room watching him watching carlos mencia perform and pacing back and forth furious essentially saying that rogan was so mad that uh, carlos mencia was killing and was being funny that's the story that carlos mencia told thinking hey joe rogan is never gonna hear this right well well that radio dj actually reached out to joe rogan directly and asked him if he wanted to hear what Carlos Mencia had to say about him. Obviously, Joe Rogan listened to the tape, and well, the rest is history. <laughs> you want to hear the greatest story? The great, yeah, here's the greatest story. Here's the greatest run-up story to that. All right. uh, Joe was on stage two Fridays ago, and then I went on after him. Oh boy. And he got off stage, and he was just like watching me, pacing. Wa- and I could see him <laughs> like look in the back of the room, and then I'd get a huge laugh, and he'd walk out, then he'd come back and get a huge laugh, then he'd walk out. <laughs> and then I got off stage, and I left. And the next day, uh, I got a phone call from uh, some of the comedians, and they're like, dude, we don't know if we fixed it. But we made them. We made them. Uh, we made them admit it. Uh, made them admit what? Right so here. here's what they did. Uh-huh. They sat. He was talking smack about me, and they said, "Dude, you can say whatever you want about him, but you know what? He doesn't steal people's material. He's great, and you know what? Right. He kills. And you have to admit that. You can say you hate him. You say you don't like him, but you have to admit that he kills. And he was like, "I will not admit that." And they're like, <laughs> "You have to do it. You have to admit that he kills." And they're like, we talked to him for an hour, and at the end of an hour, he finally said, all right, all right. I admit it. All right. He said, so he said, and they quote that he said, fine, he kills. I don't know how he does it. I can't explain it, but he kills. And then they all just walked away, and I was like, yes. I am the punisher. <laughs> that incident caused a huge back and forth between Rogan and him essentially pushing Joe Rogan to go on a tour around the United States and just completely trash Carlos Mencia. And that's another example of Carlos Mencia doing some reckless things that would clearly come back and bite him in the ass. I really do think that he didn't know, he didn't he didn't know what role the internet was going to play in his downfall in the future. He didn't realize that all the things that he did and said would be on the internet for everybody to watch again and again and again. So because of all that drama, other comedians started to feel very uncomfortable around Carlos Mencia and would slowly start to form grudges. And in my opinion, this is a very interesting thing that people don't understand. A lot of people ask, how come Amy Schumer wasn't treated the same way as Carlos Mencia? I mean, at the end of the day, she essentially was accused of doing the exact same thing as him. Well, one of the main reasons was the fact that when all these accusations came out for both of them, For Carlos Mencia, no one, and I mean no one, came out and defended him. Nobody came out in support of him. Nobody wanted to attach, nobody wanted to attach their name to Carlos Mencia. In the case of Amy Schumer, even though the evidence is clear, she did have a lot of support. A lot of comedians, a lot of people came out and supported her. And she still has a lot of fans, obviously. Also, she apologized. She came out and apologized for what she did. Carlos Mencia, to this day, to this day, keeps denying everything. He completely denies it, and to be completely honest, he doesn't give consistent answers that would satisfy people in order to believe him or not. And if you made it this far, leave a comment, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. It really helps out a lot, so I really appreciate that. And we will be uploading content at least three times a week. Thank you. After the Joe Rogan and Carlos Mencia incident, Rogan was actually banned from the comedy store and wasn't allowed to go back there for many, many years. People would start realizing the truth and watching a lot of the content that Joe Rogan was putting out, trying to expose Carlos Mencia. So when Rogan finally was allowed back in the store, him and everybody around him, his friends, adapted this very peculiar way of speaking about each other. Whenever one of their friends or colleagues would get brought up in conversation, They would always refer to that person as the best person, the funniest person. That's going to be fun. Eddie's going to be in it? Mm -hmm. He just sent me a video today. I didn't look at it yet. He's the best. 
Oh, love him. Yeah, miss it. I know, man. I <laughs> oh, he's the too. best. The best. Is he just he's the nicest person ever? They would always just say something positive about them. Only when somebody was clearly hated and was on the wrong, they would then negatively talk bad about them. And if you think about it, that's somewhat a healthy environment to be around, I believe. Because essentially, if anybody didn't follow this etiquette, if anybody broke this, these rules, well, they would eliminate their chance of ever being on the Joe Rogan experience. And some people don't realize this, but a good appearance or a couple of good appearances on the Joe Rogan experience is life changing and career changing. Joe Rogan has given so many, so many people careers. So many, so many people are having successful careers thanks to being on the Joe Rogan experience. This MO is so effective that people like Andrew Schultz literally got a spot on the Joe Rogan experience just because Brendan Shop told Rogan that the guy was very, very funny and he must listen to him. And well, after that, he completely blew up. So again, this was a perfect environment for podcasters slash comics like Brendan Shop himself to thrive and have a successful career. And well, that all came to an end on September 2020 when Joe Rogan decided to finally make the move from LA to Austin, Texas. This move was so huge that a lot of other comics actually moved their entire lives, their entire careers to Texas just to follow Joe Rogan. That's how massive, that's how, that's how insanely influential he is. As he continued to grow, his influence continued to explode, the podcast grew. This allowed him to essentially move anywhere in the country and in the world and not have it affect his business. So he made the choice to move out of LA, which meant if you were a smaller comic in LA, the door to essentially being on the Joe Rogan experience was closed. This created a vacuum and essentially pushed comics and podcasters to resort to using drama and name dropping, you know, to bring attention to their podcast. One clear example that we can all think of is Brandon Schaub. Ever since last year when Joe Rogan left, other podcasters, other comics have been going at Brandon Schaub. They've been trashing him on their platforms, making fun of him, and well, and you know, trying to get some of his haters to become their fans, essentially. This to that person, up, yeah. to that person who threatened us, I'll say this. You think you have a one over me? I dare you, dare you, let it out of your chest because that is actually not a real threat. You think you're threatening me, but it's kind of, that information's already out there, you little kid. Yeah. Can confirm. Yeah. There's, she can yeah. confirm, she can confirm, Bobby can it's confirm. It's just also, it's just, also, I just, I just want to say this, like, my currency is not money. My currency and where I see value power is in jokes. So I'm rich and you're broke. Come <laughs> after me. You've got nothing on me, you unfunny piece. Come for me, I dare you. And on that note... It will be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out, if the LA podcasting comedy scene will evolve or if it will hit a wall now that Joe Rogan has left. Highly doubt that'll happen, but once Joe Rogan opens up that comic, that comedy club in Texas, in Austin, Texas, I do think that'll be a standard, that'll be a, an industry standard to how all the other comedy clubs should operate. And hopefully that brings a new and better environment for newer comics to work on their stand-up and comedy. And if you made it this far, leave a comment, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. It really helps out a lot. So I really appreciate that. And we will be uploading content at least three times a week. Thank you.